What's up, everyone? I just recorded for about 30 minutes for this video, and because it's hot, my GoPro was overheating, and it only recorded 10 minutes out of 30 minutes. So I let it rest. I had a turkey sandwich for lunch and some green tea, and I have a fan on the camera now, uh, at least pretty close to it, so hopefully it's cooling it down. So hopefully you don't hear the fan. All right, so I wasn't going to do another greatest album covers of all time video so soon from the one that I did five months ago, but another music magazine that I'm starting to question ranked this album cover, The Velvet Underground and Nico from 1967 as the greatest album cover of all time. Andy Warhol managed The Velvet Underground like two years after they formed, and he was, of course, a famous artist that created the album cover. This is a situation where I think Billboard is trying to contend with Rolling Stone as being the most questionable music magazine in modern times. It's a banana on a white background. It says on the top right, peel slowly and see, and when you peel it back, it shows a flesh-colored banana. It's a sticker. They needed to make special machines to manufacture the covers. That's what they chose as the greatest album cover of all time. I mean, it's pretty cool and interactive, but the greatest album cover of all time, a banana. This is like telling a kid that drew you a picture of a human that looks like it has three heads and eyes that don't line up, that it's the greatest drawing in the world to not hurt their feelings. All right, so this video is obviously about some of the greatest album covers of all time as I see fit. Before we get to that, check me out on the Bird app or Twitter or X or whatever it's called now. I had already made this graphic and I was too lazy to change it, so it's what you get. I don't know if I'll ever change it. So if you want to read my brain thoughts, then follow me on Twitter slash X. And now on with some of the greatest album covers of all time. So up first isn't going to be some great piece of artwork. And I know I just basically clowned Billboard for choosing a banana as the greatest album cover of all time. But at least this album cover is extremely unique and nobody else thought about it. So I'm giving it points for that. Which could also apply to the banana, <laughs> but I don't care. Yeah, we're not going to fall for a banana in the tailpipe. You're not going to fall for the banana in the tailpipe? <laughs> this album is Return to the 36 Chambers, the dirty version by Old Dirty Bastard from 1995. The design is by Ali Trutch and the photography is by Danny Clinch. I mean, it doesn't seem like they had to do much work or rack their brains over an idea or what colors they had to use or what angle they had to take camera shots from or the lighting that they needed, but I still think this is at the very least one of the most unique album covers ever. Nobody else thought about it or had the cojones to do it. For those that were never unfortunate enough to know what this cover is about, it's a public assistance card from the state of New York at the time that identified a person that was eligible for food stamps and or welfare if they didn't make above a certain income. The weird thing is that ODB was being criticized for getting public assistance after being in the rap group Wu-Tang Clan that had put out a debut album that went platinum three times two years earlier in 1993. He was already a world famous rapper. But in his defense, Wu-Tang Clan had like 8,000 members, so maybe he didn't really get paid much from that album or the tour. This album cover was ODB's debut solo album, and he did get a $45,000 advance from Electra Records, but he never properly filed taxes, so he was still eligible for public assistance. He actually filmed going to the office in a limo on MTV and collected food stamps and a $375 a month check from welfare. The reason why I, you know, I came up with the welfare ID you know, I just want to show people, you know, how, how to be real with it. I'm on welfare right now, for real. But she put that card in there, we got food stamps. And yo, I'm glad to get the food stamps. Why wouldn't you want to get free money? After the MTV video, it's no surprise that ODB's caseworker cut off his public assistance. The card text was of course doctored to suit the album and it's a very simple cover, but it will always go down as one of the greatest or weirdest, funniest, most controversial and or whatever other words of description you can use for it. Up next, we're going to go back to 1968 for an album that's a parody of one of the album covers from the first video I did on this topic. This Beatles album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, was the inspiration for this album cover from the band The Mothers of Invention. The name of this album is We're Only In It For The Money. The design is by Cal Schenkel. I love the name of the album because it's at least honest. A lot of people don't want to admit that even though that they might not be in it solely for the money, they don't even want to mention it because they feel like they'll be viewed as sellouts or something. I actually respect someone more if they can admit it. It also reminds me of when you're on a job interview and the interviewer asked why you want to work for their company. Well, now, I just really love being abused by customers and dealing with managers' power trips. It keeps me grounded. Almost everybody lies when asked that question. Remember, Frank Zappa hired Cal Schenkel for the project, and Jerry Schatzberg also helped out photographing the collage for the cover. The photo shoot cost $4,000, which is almost $34,000 with inflation today. 
Zappa called Paul McCartney to get permission to do the parody, but McCartney said that the business managers didn't want them to go through with it. So Capitol Records objected, and it delayed the album release by five months. The Mothers of Invention's record label, Verve, packaged the album cover on the inside and put the inside artwork on the front because they were scared that they were going to get sued. And of course, this pissed off Frank Zappa. Years later, the album was reissued with the proper cover artwork. If you look down below at the bottom, you see the word Mothers strewn out in fruits and vegetables, denoting the name of the band, just like in the original Beatles cover. And they both also have the kick drum with the name of the album a little off-center, right next to what looks like member Bunk Gardner in the wheelchair. Off to the bottom left is an armless mannequin with a baby doll on its lap. And like a lot of the figures in the photo, has a black bar over its eyes as to protect the innocent, I guess. The bars were actually put on the images of people who were still alive because they were afraid someone might sue them. I don't think they would have had any problem with the baby doll, though. Now move all the way over to the right and you'll see Jimi Hendrix. That's actually Jimi Hendrix and not a cardboard cutout. He was in town and was friends with Frank Zappa, so he stood in. Jimmy's holding a cardboard cutout of Lisa Cohen, who's the daughter of the band's manager, Herb Cohen. Right next to Jimi Hendrix is a pregnant Gail Zappa, and she's holding onto Frank Zappa's arm. Gail was Frank's wife. They got married in 1967, the year before this album came out. When I saw her, I kind of thought that she looked like Billie Eilish. Kneeling beneath Gail and Jimmy is the actual designer of the album, Cal Shankle. I'm not going to name every single person on the album cover, so if you really want to know, then you can research it. I figured I'd include it because it's a parody of one of the greatest album covers of all time, so why not? Next up is the album cover from Umma Gumma by Pink Floyd from 1969. The design is by Hypnosis, which was an English art design group founded by Storm Thurgerson and Aubrey Powell. Storm was actually childhood friends with the members of Pink Floyd, too. The artwork here employs something that we've all seen before, and it's called the Drost Effect. That's just where you have a picture appear inside itself and it seemingly goes on forever, but technically it stops when the resolution of the picture stops. You could only see as far as your senses can allow. The effect is named after the Dutch brand of Coco Drost, and you can see it here on one of the canisters from 1904 with the woman holding a tray with the Coco can while she's on the Coco can. The cover was photographed at Storm Thorgerson's girlfriend's house in Cambridge, England. As you can see on the album cover, each picture that's inside itself has a rotation of the members of the band Pink Floyd on the chair. This was done to present equality among the band members. We all know that some lead singers can get an inflated ego and think that they need to always be the center of promotion around the band. You can also see the band's name on the carpet on white letters. There's always been the idea that there's some hidden meaning behind the soundtrack to the 1958 romantic comedy movie Gigi that's leaning against the wall. But Storm Thorgerson said that there's no hidden meaning and that it was just a red herring to get people debating. Gigi is based on a 1944 French novel of the same name. The controversy around Gigi is that the movie and soundtrack is seen to be misogynistic by today's standards and probably even for 1969 as well. It's about a young girl that supposedly gets groomed by a womanizing man who dates lots of women. I I haven't seen the movie or heard the soundtrack, so I can't say for sure. They also paintbrushed the sleeve of Gigi to white because they were worried about copyright issues. This album cover was probably one of the first to employ this effect at the time, and it's, it's a fresh, interesting concept other than just having a traditional drawing or photograph. The funny thing about this album cover is that it's supposedly the last one that incorporates the band members' faces or physical appearance because they weren't good looking enough to boost album sales. I have no idea how true that is, though. This next one is also by the design company Hypnosis. It's the album Go To by the band Ecstasy from 1978. The album was named Go To after the board game Go, and they just added the two. It continued the same black and white theme from Ecstasy's debut studio album, White Music, earlier in the same year. I'm not really sure how I feel about this album cover, but I do recognize its effectiveness and what it's trying to convey. The writing on the album is just an essay on how album covers are designed to attract a potential customer to buy the album. I really don't want to have to read all of it to you, so if you want to read it, then just either pause the video or find it on Google or whatever search engine floats your boat. The concept of the album cover is supposedly the only album cover to deal with the actual topic of album covers. It also reminded me of System of a Down's album, Steal This Album, from 2002. When I remembered the album by System of a Down, I also ran by an album by the hip-hop group duo called The Coup that also had an album called Steal This Album in 1998. I actually thought that System of a Down was the first to do it, but I guess not. You look at the album and you just think, okay, I haven't seen that before. What the hell is it saying? You start reading it and you're like, oh, okay. And then you either have two approaches. Obviously, you either quit reading it because it's too long and it becomes monotonous. And the text on the cover actually tells you to stop reading it if you have a free mind. 
or you keep reading it just out of sheer curiosity or maybe even sheer obsessive compulsive disorder. It's like you have to read it all the way to the end because you're being hypnotized. Then you think, well, it's kind of dull though because it's just a plain old black background with white text. But that's probably the most effective presentation. So it's definitely unique and it's probably one of the most effective ways to draw curiosity to the album. Up next is an album with a lot going on in terms of just covering the entire space of the album cover. It's the album cover to Little Creatures by Talking Heads from 1985. The design is by Tabor Kalman. This is an album cover that takes you a little while to just take in, look at everything, read everything, and try to process it all. It kind of makes you want to buy it just to take it home and go through the whole thing. Or it makes you want to take it to a table and have a cup of coffee if it's sold in a mall-like setting. I've done that before in bookstores that also had coffee sections. That's probably the worst idea because people will just read what they want without buying it. I used to do that when I was broke with an ex-girlfriend just to hang out. I mean, I'm still broke, but I don't even think that there are bookstores or many album stores around now anyway. The album has the name of the band on the top with red letters, and it has members of Talking Heads around the middle, right, sort of bottom of the album. Lead singer, guitarist, and songwriter David Burns is right here portraying Atlas holding up the world. Here on top of the house with the red roof is drummer Chris France, multi-instrumentalist and songwriter Jerry Harrison behind one of these mountains. And last but not least is singer, songwriter, and bassist Tina Weymouth next to this mountain in what seems like maybe a chapel. I'm not sure. Tibor Kalman was the designer, but at the suggestion of David Burns, he actually took a painting from Howard Finster and used it as the basis of the album cover. The words on the cover are all lyric excerpts from the songs. There are some weird elements here with a red snake down here coiling around the mountain, but the lyrics don't seem to match the visual except for the word red. On the top of the cover, there are houses and trees and people in the sea with smiling and frowning clouds above them. The mountains are also smiling and frowning. Then there are black orbs and what seem like spaceships. It's just an overall weird cover in my opinion, but that's what draws attention to it. Rolling Stone magazine actually named the cover to the Little Creatures album, Cover of the Year in 1975. Our last album cover in this video is a pretty simple album cover, but it's just so crisp and stands out that I thought it was interesting. It's Island Life by Grace Jones from 1985. The design is by Jean-Paul Goud. Grace is in what's called an arabesque pose in ballet, and it does not look like it's a comfortable position when photographing an album cover. It doesn't look comfortable even if you weren't posing for an album cover. I don't know how many shots it took, but I would imagine Grace Jones got very tired and aggravated at this shoot because they typically don't take five minutes on one photo being snapped. It was actually a montage of separate images. It's no secret that Grace Jones is a very imposing physical presence being a model, and she also has a very dark skin tone. She has a very unique look, I would say. I remember her in the movie Conan the Destroyer, where she played a crazy warrior. She's not as tall as I thought, though. She's 5'8", and for some reason I thought she was like 6 feet tall. Her wiry frame and dark skin make her stand out in this pic, especially on a light blue background. She's also standing on a blue rag that matches the background. There's a hardwood floor made of long slats and she's holding a wired microphone that runs off camera. I like the pink cloth that runs across her breasts and her left knee. And I suppose the white cloth and the other two that look like bandages are added for a bit more contrast. I wonder why the white cloth up here is dirtied up. But it's probably just because if it was a clean white, it would probably take away from the other bandages and draw the viewer's eyes away from them. I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention how shiny Grace's skin is in certain spots and how for being such a skinny woman, Grace has a pretty plump rump. The designer, John Paul Good seems to have perfectly aligned her torso and her right leg in the air with his montage design technique. The photo from this album cover has been generally recognized as one of pop culture's most famous photographs. Alright, so that's another episode in this series on the greatest album covers of all time. I think I would have to say that out of these six that my two favorites are Island Life by Grace Jones and Jean-Paul Goud and Umma Gumma by Pink Floyd and Hypnosis. I think Grace Jones takes the win here though because I'm definitely a booty man. Seriously though, I just love the contrast in that photo and how everything came together in Jean-Paul Goud's montage technique. It's a nice crisp photo with different colors that fit perfectly together and Grace Jones adds even more pop to it with her skin tone and stature. I'm sorry if it seemed like I was rushing in this video, but I was because I just didn't want the camera to overheat and not record. So it is what it is. And as you can tell right now, there's just audio in this portion because I had to re-record it and there's no video. But that's what I get for using a stupid GoPro camera, I guess.